Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we are about to do a very controversial video. There's a reason I haven't done the Epcot ranking the table service restaurants video yet. We did all the other parks a long time ago, but I didn't do Epcot because it is so hard, you guys. It is practically impossible to rank these restaurants because they're all so different. They offer different things, and then the thing that you have to take into account, of course, are the food quality, the service, the experience, experience because many of them have shows or great fireworks viewing. So there's experiences to take into consideration. You have to think about characters. Are the characters there or not? And of course, many of these restaurants are going to be great options for certain families and they're not going to suit other families. So I'm at a loss, but I figured I'd combine the feedback from our team here at DFB, our viewers and readers and followers over on social media and anyone else that will talk to me about Epcot restaurants and go ahead and do the ranking. And then you guys can yell at me in the comments. <laughs> that's that's what I expect. So go ahead and yell at me in the comments about it. Let me know what you think should be ranked. But just know that probably next week, all of this could change and most of these guys can move around. Is that enough of a disclaimer? Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, this is a try at ranking the Epcot table service restaurants, but I'm gonna use this opportunity mostly to let you know the pros and cons of these restaurants so that you can figure out if they're right for your family or not. All right, here we go. I am gonna go best to worst on this one because I really wanna talk about my favorites here at the top. I'm gonna start with Garden Grill, and I know that this one is controversial for you guys. Some of you don't really like Garden Grill, you don't like the food, you don't like the experience, and others of you absolutely love and adore it. So it's at the top of my list because I think it gives you the best quality in terms of food and characters and entertainment. It's an interesting setting, and it's all you care to eat as well. So based on the price, it's a pretty decent value. And that's why I always recommend Garden Grill because I think if you want see Mickey Mouse at a restaurant. This one is a great option. It's not a buffet. You don't have to get up and go get your food and potentially miss a character. And it's really, really good food as well. In my experience, I've really enjoyed the options I've had here. Again, it's all you care to eat, so they'll bring you more of anything. And it's really fresh, really good stuff. A lot of it was created or made right there in the Land Pavilion. And that's where this is located. It's upstairs in the Land Pavilion, and it's in a rotating restaurant. So the restaurant will actually turn around, spin around very slowly as you're dining, and you'll get the chance to look at a few scenes from the Live In With The Land attraction downstairs. And you do get to see Mickey, you get to see Pluto, and Chip and Dale, and they will come around often. Usually, when I've dined there, I've seen them twice, which is a big, important thing to note for character dining, because a lot of those restaurants are so big that you really only get to see those characters once, and because they're buffets and things move quickly, you might only see them once, or maybe not at all. You might have to kind of sit around and wait for them to get to your table, but my experience at Garden Grill is I've seen the characters multiple times. All right, next up, number two for me is Le Cellier. Le Cellier is over in Canada. And I think a lot of you will probably disagree with me on this one as well because Le Cellier is so expensive. It's very expensive and it's also very heavy food. And so there are only a handful of signature restaurants in the theme parks because they do serve very heavy, very rich food. These are signature restaurants or the higher end, more expensive restaurants. And so they're gonna serve expensive food that you wanna get your money's worth on. But again, once you leave a signature restaurant in a theme park, then you're kind of weighed down for the rest of the day. So a lot of people don't like to hit up Le Cellier unless it's for dinner or maybe right before the fireworks or something like that. Anyway, that said, Le Cellier is in the Canada Pavilion. It is called Le Cellier because it is basically a wine cellar. It's a very small restaurant. There aren't very many tables and it is a steak restaurant. So it's essentially a steakhouse. And so you're going to get several cuts of steak and side dishes like you'll find in a regular steakhouse. So they have several options of poutine there and it's not it's usually authentic poutine, but it's kind of Disney's spin on poutine or a higher end signature restaurant kind of spin on poutine. There's risottos, there are vegetables, french fries, other standard sort of steakhouse sides there as well. And of course, you're gonna have some vegetarian options and you're also gonna have your steak, your chicken, your fish, as is normal in any Disney table service restaurant. Desserts here are hit or miss. It really depends on who the pastry chef is at the time. They always have the maple creme brulee, which is usually pretty 
good if you're a creme brulee fan and you like a maple flavor, obviously. And it's usually a pretty good creme brulee. I'm not a huge creme brulee fan, but I do like the maple creme brulee here. They have a cute dessert for the kids most of the time, which is called chocolate mousse, which is this um, little tiny actual mousse made out of chocolate mousse. Super cute. But I really like La Cellier. The service has always been great in my experience. I love steak and they always make great steaks here. Their quintessential dish is their filet with their mushroom risotto, which is just killer. And there's a truffle butter sauce. We have the recipe on the site on Disney Food Blog for that. But it's just, I love this restaurant. I always have, even though now it's way too expensive for what you get. I still love it and I still go. All right, next up, I'm going to talk about tapenado. This one will, I'm sure all of these are going to be controversial, I'm sure. <laughs> That's okay. Let me know in the comments what you think. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be helpful for our viewers to see what you guys think too. So Tapanado is over in the Japan Pavilion and this is Tapanyaki. If you've been to a Benihana or something like that in your hometown, this is going to be a similar experience. You're going to sit around a big table with a huge hot plate grill in the middle and then a chef will come out and he will create your meal for you right in front of you, which is really fun because it's a basically an entertainment addition to the meal. So you get to watch the chef who's also you usually a show person, honestly. They make fun pictures out of the food on the grill. They do some fun little bits. They are definitely entertainers as well as chefs. So it's a great experience. The kids really enjoy it too. And it's a good opportunity to not only have your kids experience a fun and interactive meal, but also to introduce them to possibly some Japanese cuisine that maybe they wouldn't be daring enough to try at home. They always call that the Mickey Mouse factor, that some kids are willing to try some new dishes or some new items that maybe they'd be scared to try at home because they're in Disney World and why would anything taste bad in Disney World, right? So anyway, Tapanetto, in addition to be a show and in addition to usually having good service here, I really do enjoy the food. I think they have some excellent, excellent steaks. I like that you have the option for the seafood and the chicken and the steak mix. You can also have vegetarian options. I've really enjoyed my food here even though the menu is pretty minimal. And also note that they do have a Wagyu add-on here. Pretty expensive, but probably the second best Wagyu I've had in Disney World to date. Next up, let's head over to Via Napoli. I'm putting this one in here mostly because my husband made me. <laughs> <laughs> I do like Via Napoli. I like it a lot and I like it enough to be here at, at the top end. It's sitting here right now at number four. This is my husband's favorite restaurant in Epcot. I know a lot of you love it too. This is Italy's pizza restaurant, but it is a table service and it is gourmet pizza for all um, intents and purposes. It's wood fired right there when you order it. It's um, really delicious Naples style pizza. So I really like it. They also have some good pastas here. The desserts aren't great unless you're a huge tiramisu fan, even if you are the tiramisu isn't probably the best you can get in Disney World as it is. But overall, this is a place that's going to please a lot of your family members because it's pizza, it's pasta, it's a fun, kind of exuberant, joyful atmosphere in there. It's this huge room that's super echoey and loud, but it's a lot of fun and nobody's gonna look twice if your kid's kind of being a little bit loud or if the baby's crying, they won't even hear it because it's too loud in there anyway. But I think a lot of people's families will be pleased with this choice. So this will fit a broad range of Disney guests. All right, next, I'm going to do Rose and Crown. And frankly, if it wasn't for my husband's influence, I would probably put Rose and Crown above Via Napoli, but Via Napoli would be right there. So Rose and Crown is over there in the UK Pavilion, and it is a restaurant specializing sort of in pub food. You're going to get fish and chips. You're going to get sticky toffee pudding. There's going to be bangers and mash, scotch eggs, things like that that are quintessential pub food over in the UK. Service here is usually very good, and the food, while it is heavy, is actually pretty delicious. I got a chance to speak to the chef the last time I was there and he was really great and talking very much about how he's trying to make sure that the classic flavors are still there while there's a little bit of innovation in the menu as well. So your favorite dishes will never leave the menu but they are changing up the menu once in a while to bring in some interesting things like some curries and things like that that are popular in the UK today. Also Rosencrown is a great place to watch the Illuminations fireworks but note if you are sitting indoors you will not be able to see the Illuminations fireworks from your table. You'll have to get up and go outside to the the patio to see them, which is kind of awkward because there's already people sitting on the patio and they're kind of annoyed when you come out from inside to watch the fireworks because they waited a long time for their patio table. So it's kind of a weird, awkward situation to have, you know, space to stand and watch the fireworks unless they've changed it. They might have changed that by now. I'll have to check the next time I'm there or let us know in the comments if you've been there recently and they've changed that experience. But usually what you want to do is wait for a fireworks view table and always ask for that fireworks view table at Rose and Crown so they'll 
sit you on the front patio instead of on the side patio where you don't have as good a view. And if you do want that view, make sure to arrive maybe 30 minutes early for your reservation. Make a reservation for about 45 minutes before the fireworks start. So usually that's about 7.45 and arrive around 7.15 and say, we'll wait for a fireworks view table. And also make sure to tip your server significantly because if you're gonna take up their table for like an hour and a half, definitely you know tip them extremely well for taking up that table for that amount of time. Next up, I'm gonna talk about Hacienda de San Angel over in Mexico. This spot is an interesting number six. It is quite expensive, but it is authentic Mexican food and it is pretty good. And of course, they've got all those great margaritas and drinks from La Cava del Tequila. Same company owns all of the restaurants in Mexico. And so they all have that great mixology program that originated over at La Cava. So here, the main reason why this is where it is in the mix is because it is probably the best fireworks view you're going to get because you can see the fireworks by sitting inside. You don't have to be outside in the heat. You can get the air conditioning and see the fireworks. And also, you know, if you're watching the fireworks when it's raining or if there's some other weather situation, you get to be inside. It's still a great view of the fireworks. You don't have to worry. Usually you can get a decent view from just about any table in the restaurant, except for there's one little room that doesn't have a great view. So again, always ask for a fireworks view table when you check in. And also this one isn't as popular as a lot of the other sort of fireworks view restaurants. So you can usually get a table more last minute for this location. But yes, it is expensive. That's the biggest con for La Hacienda is the price on the food here. Take that into account before you make your reservation. Okay, next we're gonna go to Beer Garden. Beer Garden is great. And again, looking at this list, any of these could change places at any time based on, you know, your inclination of, or particular person working at the restaurant that night. Via Napoli, Rosencrown, Hacienda, Beer Garden, and all, and, and most of these middle guys could change by two or three spots at any time in, in my list, even day over day. So it's really hard to rank these. But anyway, I know I talked about that a lot at the beginning. So Beer Garden is over there in the Germany Pavilion. This is a giant indoor outdoor festival. So you are indoors, but everything inside looks like you're outdoors. So there's trees and there's a moon up in the sky and the indoors, you're kind of supposed to be at an outdoor Oktoberfest festival. There's long tables. You will be sharing the tables with somebody else if you are not a party of eight. And this is the same situation at Teppanetto, by the way. You will be sharing that table with another family if you don't have eight people in your table. Or I'm sorry, eight people in your party. And it is a buffet. So you're going to get to go up and enjoy your fill of sausage and spätzle and schnitzel and all kinds of German eats. And the food is pretty decent. The food's okay. I would probably say that the food is the con here, even though it's okay. It's probably not the best food you're going to eat in Epcot for sure. But the experience is what puts this where it is in the list. They have a fun show going on at the beer garden most of the time. They have alpenhorns. They have bells players. They have a full kind of four piece band playing sometimes and there's a dance floor down there so you can head down with your kids and kind of get out some energy and have some fun on the dance floor so there's a lot going on here another great part about beer garden maybe for some of you will be that they do serve liters of beer which are giant 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 mugs of beer so if you are a beer fan you can definitely go have some great imported options in that huge serving size but this is a great place to make memories with grandma and grandpa you know you get you get the picture of grandma and grandpa dancing with their granddaughter or their grand sun down on the dance floor, things like that. This is one of those places, one of those restaurants where you're going to make memories for sure with your family. Next up is Akershus, and this is over in Norway, in the Norway Pavilion. This is a princess restaurant, so you're going to head here. It's a giant stone castle. It's not giant. It's actually pretty small. Stone castle. I don't want you to think it's like Cinderella Castle or anything. It's definitely not. So you go inside, and there's flags hanging from the ceilings. This is probably two-story ceilings, and there are several princesses that you'll get to see, like Belle and Aurora is sometimes there. Cinderella is often there. We've seen Jasmine, Snow White, etc., etc. So the eats here are going to be obviously a little bit on the Norwegian side, a little bit on the Scandinavian side. So there's going to be a lot of fish options. There's going to be meatballs and maybe a few choices that you and your family haven't experienced or haven't experienced often. So this might be a good opportunity to, you know, have breakfast with the princesses and try some, you know, peppered mackerel or something. There's some some good trade-offs here, but this one falls here because I think the food is a little bit unfamiliar to a lot of folks. And so it might not be a good choice for you if you have a bunch of really picky 
eaters in your family. Now, of course, there's options here for everybody and not to worry about that. But to get the full experience of the restaurant, there's a lot of things that could be tried that you want to make sure that you're going to the place with the right menu for your family. Slotted in next is going to be Spice Road Table over in the Morocco Pavilion. This one is right there on the water, so there's an incredible view of illuminations from the indoor seating or the outdoor seating. Now, I walk by the outdoor seating a lot and see it pretty empty, even right before illumination. So remember that this restaurant is there and there's opportunity to see a great view of illuminations while you're sitting down and dining that a lot of people don't even take advantage of. So like I said, indoor and outdoor seating, it's a beautiful restaurant restaurant not a lot of indoor seats but you know definitely the opportunity to make an, an advanced dining reservation and get a nice view of illuminations there are tapas on the menu and there are also full entree sized meals um, when this restaurant first opened it was just kind of a tapas restaurant but they very quickly added full service meals so that you can use the dining plan with this spice road has moved around a lot on my list it's bumped up a little bit here after my most recent visit this past week they've done and some interesting things with the menu, the standards, the favorites are still there, like the skewers and the um, stuffed grape leaves. That wonderful garlicky, fabulous shrimp is still there. And I've liked that they've added a fried shrimp here as well. And those spicy hummus fries that everybody loves, loves, loves from the Epcot Food and Wine Festival Morocco booth are here as well. So you can get them year round. Anyway, lots of good stuff here at Spice Road. The illuminations view is great. I think the only concern with this restaurant would be if you have super picky eaters in your party or if you have someone like me who's not a big cilantro fan cilantro tends to sneak its way into a lot of the dishes here at spice road so you'll have to ask specifically if they don't have cilantro and again picky eaters are sometimes a little nervous about the moroccan restaurant the moroccan food and spice road is a little bit on the edge between moroccan and mediterranean so definitely you know keep an eye on that look at the menu before you go make sure that everybody's got something they can eat at spice road before you go but beautiful restaurant, great view of illuminations, and I don't think enough people take advantage of this one. Next up, Chefs de France over there in the France Pavilion. This is the mid-priced restaurant here. It's not the most expensive and it's not the counter service joint either. So here you're going to get sort of French bistro food. This is designed like a bistro on the streets of Paris. So you're going to get roasted chicken and steak frites and pizzettas and profiteroles and things like that. Sort of what you would expect to get at a street cafe in Paris. The service here has always been mediocre, but it's getting a little bit better in my past couple of visits. The food here is actually quite good, which is why I recommend this place. They've got a good prefix menu as well. They've got some great macaroni and cheese and some other really good options. The desserts are nice as well. So this is a good place to kind of sit and watch the world go by on the World Showcase Promenade. You can see the fireworks a little bit from here if you ask for a window table. So Chefs de France is kind of a good mid-priced option for some pretty decent food, I would say. Next up, Tutto Gusto. Tutto Gusto is over in Epcot, Italy, and this is the lounge. And I'm including this one and not including La Cava in this list because Tutto Gusto has access to the full menu from Tutto Italia next door. So you can get full plates here as well, which is why I'm including this one in this list. Tutto Gusto is where you're going to have small plates and appetizers, cheese dishes, cheese selections, I should say, paninis, some great wines. Of course, this is essentially a wine bar. And then of course you have access to the dishes from the Italian restaurant next door. This is a no reservation location, so you won't be able to get a reservation for here. It's walk up only, which is why it's a good option. Maybe during those busy times when all of the restaurants are booked up, you might be able to get in here more easily on an off time. So right at 11 a.m. or 11.30 when they open, or maybe around you know 3.30 in the afternoon would be a good time to visit. The food here is exceptional. I do love the option to get those fresh imported cheeses, charcuterie, and try all all those various different wines. Now this is probably gonna be better for a family with older kids or maybe a family who's visiting without kids because it is a wine bar. It's gonna be pretty boring for the little ones. Most likely they would probably enjoy, you know, Teppan Edo or Beer Garden or even Coral Reef more than a place like this. But if you have a little cheese lover or someone like that, then this is a good option for you as well. 
Next up is Tokyo Dining, back over in the Japan Pavilion. This is where you're gonna wanna go if you're looking for decent sushi in World Showcase. They make the sushi on stage, right there in the restaurant. Lots of different options. If you are not a sushi fan though, this is not for you. They do have options on the menu that are non-sushi, but they're not great. Really nothing that's stand out. I went here when I was pregnant and had to get one of the non-sushi options and it was just kind of blah. It was like a blah steak or something like that. It wasn't great. Great, but if you do like sushi and you're in Epcot, this is one of the places that I can recommend to grab sushi. Now it's not off the charts stuff, but it is quite good and it is authentic as well. Don't forget that at Tokyo Dining, there's also some decent fireworks viewing. There are some tables by the floor to ceiling windows where you'll be able to watch the fireworks, but also note that there is a balcony outside right in front of the windows where people often stand to watch the fireworks. So you're not going to get an unobstructed view of those fireworks here. So this is not a recommended location to get your great, perfect view of illuminations. Same with the next one, Restaurant Marrakesh. I think Restaurant Marrakesh is excellent. I actually really enjoy this restaurant, but it's a little bit lower on the list because I think if you have extremely picky eaters or your family's not open to maybe some different flavors or different tastes, it's probably not gonna be the right choice for you. This is in the Morocco Pavilion, way, way, way in the back. You kind of have to go wander your way through the marketplace to get back here, but it is beautiful, you guys. The experience here and the atmosphere is stunning. The King of Morocco had his own artisans sent over to create this place so the tiles and the fabrics are just incredible truly royal I mean they're plush and gorgeous and what's fun about this place too is that you do have some good entertainment they have some Moroccan music going on they have a belly dancer who invites the kids to come up and dance with her which is a lot of fun to see they're so cute dancing with her and so there's some good entertainment going on here even though you can't this won't be a fireworks viewing location and the food here is quite good it is Moroccan food you're gonna have meat skewers couscous great baklava and some good authentic dishes so definitely if you are interested in trying some international eats or international food go here and try some things out test some things out of course they know they're in a theme park and so they are choosing dishes that are going to be broadly acceptable to many different palates and so you're in a good place to try some new things here at restaurant Marrakesh Next up is Monsieur Paul, and this one is probably going to be very, very, very disagreed with as well because everyone I talk to loves Monsieur Paul. I have been three or four times, I think four times now, since it changed from Bistro de Paris, and I just can't get it here. I don't love the food. The service has always been mediocre for me, and it's way too expensive to have food that you don't love and mediocre service. I'm sure that's how some of you feel about others of these restaurants as well, but I've never had a great experience here, but other people, everyone else I talk to, absolutely loves this restaurant. This is a signature location in the France Pavilion. It's the most expensive restaurant in the France Pavilion. You're gonna get some truly fascinating dishes here. And so I can't wait to see what you guys say in the comments. I'm sure you've had great experiences and please, please, please list them because the fact that my experiences haven't been great doesn't mean that this place isn't a good option for you and your family or for date night and things like that. So let us know in the comments. Did you eat at Monsieur Paul? Did you love it? What was your experience? I can't wait to hear it. Don't forget here at Monsieur Paul, you, there are a few tables where you can see a decent fireworks view. The windows are really small. I don't know if that's due to the kind of the forced perspective of the way they built the building, but the windows are real small. So you do have to be sitting kind of at a window table in order to get a decent view of illuminations from here. Next, we're gonna head over to Nine Dragons in the China Pavilion, and I know I know you guys, this one's always been on my worst restaurants list, but I was there recently, I was there last week, they've changed up the menu a little bit, they're doing some interesting things, and I loved it, I really, really enjoyed my visit there, the service was excellent. The food here, here's the thing with the food at Nine Dragons, it's pretty much the Americanized Chinese food that you're gonna get at most Chinese food restaurants, it's kind of like chain restaurant Chinese food, which frankly is pretty popular here in the United States. They've got a lot, lot, lot of, you know, I'm a big fan of fried thing with a spicy aioli, which seems to be, you know, that seems to be the winning trend for any mid-priced restaurant right now is do a fried thing with spicy aioli and they'll love it. And it's true, we do. So they're doing that a lot over here now. There's a lot of fried spicy things happening. They have a spicy honey sesame chicken right now. They've got a lot of pork belly on the menu. They have some pork belly bao buns. They have a pork belly entree. You know, I'm a 
big pork belly fan, they had some yummy, yummy, yummy fried shrimp. I love firecracker shrimp and they had a lot of things on the menu that had the same sort of concept, that fried spicy situation going on. I thought it was really, really good. Dessert was not good here. Just skip it. If you're not on the dining plan, just skip dessert and go get dessert someplace else because desserts just aren't going to do it for you here. Not even that banana cheesecake. That was not good. But overall, I had a really enjoyable meal, great service, and I was impressed with Nine Dragons on this visit. So it did bump up in my list a few spots. Next up is Tutto Italia over in the Italian Pavilion. This is their largest Italian restaurant over there. Again, this is also run by Patina Group, which Via Napoli is run by Patina Group, Tutto Gusto, all of the Italian restaurants in Disney Springs are Patina Group and in Disneyland. So they run a lot of the restaurants in Disney World and Disneyland. Tutto Italia has been around for a long, long time. It's gone through a name change, several menu changes, but the menu is still going to be pretty standard, heavy Italian food. So lots of pastas, some meats, and some authentic dishes from Italy. This is not the best Italian food I've ever had. This is kind of low on my list because I've never eaten here and been like, that was a great meal. Every time I come out, I'm like, ah, oh, it was okay, <laughs> you know? So it's never been awesome and the, the service has always been kind of lukewarm, I guess. It has been my experience here. So I wanna hear what you have to say about this one too. Let us know in the comments. Do you love Tutto Italia? Would you prefer going to Via Napoli over Tutto Italia or one of maybe the other higher priced restaurants around the World Showcase? Let us know what you think. All right, here's Coral Reef. This one's difficult because it's got a great draw in that you're sitting in the middle of the giant aquarium in the Seas Pavilion, the Seas with Nemo and friends over there in Future World. So when you walk in, you've got this huge, great view of the aquarium. Sometimes the divers come over and interact with you. There's sharks going by all the time, huge manta rays. It's so much fun to see what's going on in that aquarium and to be in a restaurant that's right there at the bottom, right in the middle of all of it. Very cool. The food here is is mediocre to decent. It's not great. It's usually a little bit above the quality of like wedding food, like what you would get at your friend's wedding, you know? So catered food, kind of standard, but it's not bad. It's not bad. I was just there this past week. I had some shrimp and grits that were really good, really cheesy grits, a delicious aioli kind of sauce going on. The calamari is awesome here. The steak is always okay. Like it's not steakhouse quality steak, but it's okay. You know, the fish dishes here, they've got a lot lobster mac and cheese is really popular. Again, the quality isn't quite up at the level that I'd like to see for those prices, but you've got the draw of the aquarium. You've got decent food and certain dishes are much better than others here. So anyway, definitely has a draw, definitely some decent food, but it is here down at the bottom of our list because the food isn't as great as it should be for that price point. I really wish it was better. They, they have a lot of opportunities to make that better. And finally, San Angel Inn over there in the Mexico Pavilion. This is inside the pyramid. This one it just runs hot and cold, and this is pretty much the experience I hear from everybody too, is that it's either good or it's awful. <laughs> Those are the two options. It's never great, and it's either good and okay, or it's just a really bad experience. So it serves Mexican food, Mexican options, and like I said, it's inside the pyramid, so it's a really interesting atmosphere. It's always nighttime, of course, in the marketplace inside the pyramid, and you can see the boat ride, the Mexican boat ride going by. So it's right up there by the water this restaurant is. It's very dark in there, so you may wanna, you know, make sure you have a flashlight on your phone to read your menu and see your food if you're interested in taking pictures or having that sort of perspective. Again, the service here has never been great and the food's never been awesome, which is shocking to me because these are the same people that run La Cava and Hacienda de San Angel and the food there is just seems to be so much better than it is here at San Angel. But again, I definitely wanna know what you guys think. What are your experience at San Angel? Have you had great dinners? Have you had great meals? Have you had mediocre meals? Have you had awful meals here? Let us know in the comments, especially with these ones I'm putting down at the bottom of my list. I want you guys to let us know what your thoughts are because it can help our viewers exponentially to see what you guys think. So San and Hell, I'm not in any rush to get back there. And usually when I do go, it's only because I have to review it. So that's been my experience with San and Hell. So there's the list of all of the Epcot table service restaurants. We've finally ranked them. And like I said, all of those guys in the middle, they're gonna probably change around on a daily basis, depending on who's working and what the menu is and what your family's day is looking like that day. So that's why I think the comments are gonna be really important for this particular video. Let us know in the comments your personal experiences at these restaurants so that our viewers can read them and see what you guys have to say as well. We based it on our team and on our families and on a lot of our followers and a lot of our commenters. Pre 
previously, but anything can change and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks for listening and thanks for watching. This is AJ for Disney Food Blog and we'll see you real soon.